Okay, so I want to thank everyone for coming. We have mics set up today, so it's a little bit different. But this is the return of the James Brown Memorial Lecture, which is something we had done in years past at the library and we're trying to bring back. Um, so tonight we have author Morgan Talty, whose new book, Night of the Living Res, is uh, based on uh, Native experiences in our local area, actually. He's from Levant. And we also have Lisa Sakabasin, who is the co-CEO of Wabanaki Public Health and Wellness. And they're going to be talking about the book, they're going to be talking about the Native experience in Maine, and whatever else might come up. So let's all give a warm welcome to them. What's up? I'm being asked to start off. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Thank you all for being here. It's uh, been so great to do live events again, like after so long. I know, like, before my book came out, it was like this big fear of mine. It was like, is everything going to be virtual or are we going to be like able to see people? Mm -hmm. And I lucked out in that everybody stopped pretending COVID was a thing <laughs> and um, crawled, everyone decided to do what Texas had been doing since it started. Um, pretending it was not real, and uh, or gone, and here we are. Um, I don't know if I've offended people or not already, but, uh, so yeah, I've started things off. Yeah, you sure have. <laughs> well, welcome, everybody. Um, it is awesome to be here in Dover Foxcroft. I graduated Foxcroft Academy, and one of my first homes was, well, it's now the police station. <laughs> And we had an apartment in, in that building, so it's very cool to be here. I mean, I remember as a kid just running across the lawn and coming to the library. And the library was always a place where you just felt safe. And so it's so cool to be back here and also cool to be here with an Indigenous author, especially an Indigenous author that has seen so much success. And I know you don't like to talk about that, <laughs> no. but again, here we are. And so we're going to talk about the book. I know you're going to read some in the book. Yeah. And we're also going to take questions from all of you. I know we have some Indigenous young people in the audience, and I already know one of them has a question for you. All right. So we'll do that as well. Um, let's start off with a question. Go on. Hey, let's do it. The first question is about the cover. I am interested um, in the cover, and you'll find out some of the interests in a bit, but I just wanted to understand where the cover came from, where the title came from, because the title is pretty catching, or at least that's what I've heard from our youth. They love the title. So if you could talk about that, that would be great. Yeah, the title, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. The title, yeah, I'm glad uh, the title worked out. It was catchy and it was marketable. Um, no. Um, so the cover, actually, so for the title, um, the first story I ever actually wrote for this book was the title story, Night of the Living Res. And I'd written that in 2015, I think. And, um, you know, I worked on the book between 2017 and late 2019. Um, but really, 2015 was when I started it. And I'd had that story, that title story. And the original title of the book was called The Little Yellow House because um, one of the motifs in a lot of my work was constantly saying this little yellow house that these mm -hmm. people lived in. Um, and I had a mentor who was like, I think you should title it Night of the Living Reds. He's like, if I were in a bookstore and I saw that, I would pick it up immediately. And I was like, Okay, you know, and I, for me it was just the title, so I was like, I get what you're saying, so I changed the title, mm -hmm. and so I take no credit for titling this book. I did really did nothing. Um, in fact, the guy who did should get royalties or something. Um, but for the cover, the cover art, I they asked Tin House, my publisher asked me early on. They're like, um, can you send us some book covers of books that you really really like? And I did. I sent them some and. Um, I sent them some, and the thing with book, the thing with publishers and um, publishers and book covers is they very rarely will like work with an author on a cover. Like they have their whole team like mm -hmm. do stuff, and if the author doesn't like it, they're just like too bad. Um, and 
I had this dream one night of like what like I'd got my book like it hadn't come out I hadn't seen mm-hmm. a cover or anything yet and I was like oh that's pretty cool it was like the night sky mm-hmm. and um I don't know I woke up I drew this picture that was so bad that was so bad <laughs> I sent it to Tin House and I was like can my book look like this and I don't know like I really I bet they were laughing hysterically at how like it was like a second grader's drawing like that's how bad it was and there was like a comet for like I don't even know and I sent it to them, and they were all, like, nice. And they're like, yeah, we can incorpor- incorporate this. And I never heard from them again about it. <laughs> and then they showed me the cover, and it was this. It was the night sky, and it had uh, the title, Night of the Living Res, with what is, like, the dawn, I guess, maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, the dawn sky, a part of it. And I was like, that's great. You know, I'll, mm-hmm. I'll take it. And so... I don't know if they plan to put stars in it the whole time or if my my um, really crappy drawing inspired them, but that's sort of how it came out. Thank you. One of the focuses of the work that I do at Wabanaki Public Health and Wellness is around youth leadership and youth representation in general media, um, authors, when you were writing this book, you have made a huge impact in the youth pop- Wabanaki youth population in seeing themselves in writing. Was that an intention? I think maybe subconsciously it mm-hmm. was, and also intent, and, and also a conscious decision later on in the editorial process. Mm-hmm. Um, I just had a lot of fun writing with David's point of view and his friends. And, you know, a lot of the David stories are very similar to, you know, what my friends and I used to do, you know, on the Penobscot Nation, um, whether it was beating each other up with sticks Mm -hmm. or canoeing and, you know, poking that one kid's canoe with your paddle (laughs) and trying to get him to tip over, you know, walking out on the ice and stuff, you know, like just these things that, I don't know, I just, I loved, you know, being outside when it was like negative 20 and trying to start a fire in the woods with people, you know, just to hang out, you know, and um, I just, like, it was, it was, it, I had lived it so hard that it was very easy for me to, mm-hmm. you know, have these characters do these things, mm-hmm. um, and, you know, when I got to D and Fellas, when I encountered them as characters, the same thing, they're, they, mm-hmm. they're still out in the woods, they're still doing sort of like youthful type things that I did, you know, growing up, um, you know, minus the immense amount of drugs and stuff. Um, but yeah, it was like, I just, I just felt like I needed to write from that space. Mm -hmm. And I liked writing young characters because I feel like you either get young characters and you get shoved in this young adult category Mm -hmm. or you write young characters and it's like, an unrelatable young character like they're just like so sophisticated you know what i mean like and not in a bad way but because you have to please old like older um older readers you know instead of young young adults but um yeah i'd say it was a conscious decision as well as a subconscious one thank you in talking about the character development when i read the story i felt like i knew these people and one of the things that we're hearing in in the conversations we're having in community is that people feel like they know these people. And so can you talk a little bit about how you developed your characters? Um, you wrote from David's perspective. You relate to David, obviously. But can you talk a little bit about your characters? It's funny. When the book first came out, everybody – my my aunt's the tribal clerk on the Penobscot Nation. Um, for like two weeks, everybody kept going in her office, like, and didn't need like registrations or anything. They just kept coming in, being like, "So who's who in the book?" Like they wanted, it, they, <laughs> they wanted, wanted to know, know. Who, who people were um, because they were sensing. Mm-hmm. They were like, "I see maybe this person here or sure. this person there," and like for me, like I think David Page and Mom are strange, molded versions of you know, my own sister and my own mother. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I started writing David as a character when I first started writing, like 
12 years ago, and I came to writing as writing nonfiction and memoir stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, when I started to gravitate towards um, fiction, because I would tell stories where I'm like, oh, it'd be cool if this could happen. Mm -hmm. And I just started to move into that sphere. Um, my mom had told me one time, she was like, if I hadn't named you Morgan, I was going to name you David. And so I was mm -hmm. like, I'll just make this person's name David. And it just it just stayed there. Like, I, I have no real association anymore with, like, that sure. character being me in any way. Right. But, like, those three are very similar to, you know, based off of, like, the memoir writing I did and their mm -hmm. attitudes and stuff. Um, but everybody else in the book is just sort of, like, for me, my, my approach to character is, like, thinking about what characters want, you know, mm -hmm. what, what they'll do to get it, um, thinking about the situations they're in, thinking about how they'll sort of get out of stuff mm -hmm. um and i really just am like okay how can i make this person look bad how can i make them look good how can i make a reader hate them how can i make a reader love them because like, i feel like that's like the real thing with people is like yeah. we can love someone dearly but then also just be like oh my god you know i want to mm -hmm. slam your hand in a drawer or something you know what i mean like and so like that's my approach to characters like i want to show that messy in between of like mm -hmm. the good and the bad and in this book, there's so much difficulty with relationships, like mm -hmm. people who are not there for each other, but then ultimately are. Right. And a part of like my mission with this book later on in revision mm -hmm. and stuff was thinking about the ways that we need to be there for people that we can that can easily be disposed of mm -hmm. in a way in that society has disposed of, mm -hmm. you know, people who suffer from addiction mm -hmm. or um, who are abnormal mm -hmm. right outside of what we deem normal um so my approach is really just getting at the heart of a person mm -hmm. and i don't know just trying to evoke the emotion that that they have and that they can impose on the world in that specific mm -hmm. story yeah maybe you know i think about the excitement in wabanaki territory wabanaki people for the stories and Maybe it is that invisibility that indigenous people have felt for so long. And now being so visible in these stories and seeing our language in these stories. And, you know, language loss is a huge issue in our communities and um, in all Wabanaki communities. And then I think about addiction you tackle those issues, or you talk about them. You handle some of the most complex issues our, our organization is tackling. And then I also, you know, as a public health person, I see um, how cigarettes are so common in this story. Did anyone else notice that? And I had some of my team do some numbers. Oh, my God. I, I want to hear this. <laughs> no, no, no. I didn't. I, you know, we can talk about them later. But it was so interesting to me because it just made sense. Because when you think about cigarettes in our communities, it's pretty pervasive. And the data suggests that, too. So more people in our community smoke than don't. So it's about 58%. It may have increased over COVID. We're doing a study now, so we'll find out. But it made sense. It was truth, you know, and it was also shocking. So when I think about all the things you tackle, I want to know how you took care of yourself through this writing. Because they're big issues. And Maybe they're not as impactful, and it's a way to way to talk about them. But I want to hear from you. How do you ground yourself through this work? It's a great question. I don't know if I'm kicking. Yeah, you. I know. Um, first, a note on the cigarettes. I <laughs> I need to run a word count on how many times cigarette or cigarettes or smoke appears in the book. Mm -hmm. I had a student who um, mm -hmm. I just wrote a recommendation letter for, and uh, he was like. He's like, I read your book. He's like, I really, really liked it. Um, and he said, he goes, I have never in my life smoked a cigarette, nor have I ever had the desire to smoke a cigarette. He's like, after reading your book, though, I want to smoke cigarettes. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, oh, dear. Um, 
And then if you look really closely, this is actually um, <laughs> supported by uh, tobacco companies. Um, yeah, Mar Marble Red sponsored the book. Um, partners for the Thompson, Thompson Library, the event tonight. Um, thank you to Marlboro. Yeah, thank you to Marlboro, yeah. Um, but no, it, it's a great question because it, it, it can get hard to write these issues over mm -hmm. and over and over again. And I think, I think for like as I think I'll answer this in sort of like a writer way, you know, like when I write, you know, I'm trying to trying to tell an interesting story, mm -hmm. which takes a lot of balancing, a lot of different elements. But like above all, I'm trying to get to trying to tell a story that reaches sort of like a transcendental moment mm -hmm. for myself and for the reader. Like when I finish a story and I'm like, and this happens because I don't plot, I don't really plan, I just write. And then I kind of kind of feel my way through the story. I'll make notes and you know and, and that sort of thing. But when I get surprised, that's when I know I've I, I've come across something. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's always been, I think, the alleviating factor mm -hmm. for handling these difficult you know co uh, difficult topics mm -hmm. um, or difficult situations that get shown. Um, you know, knowing that. You know, I'm working to try to find a moment where me and the reader both experience this otherworldly aspect. Mm -hmm. um, so there's that part. And then the other part, I think, is humor. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there'll be, like, there's so much stuff that didn't get put in the book mm -hmm. that was just me, I think. You know how when you experience something bad, you'll, like, start joking about it? You'll have like a knife in your arm and you're like, isn't this funny? You, you know what I mean? Like you, you, you compartmentalize that pain through, you know, joking. And I think I did that a lot with the book and I cut a lot of that humor out. Um, some of it, I mean, a lot of it remained, I think, just because you need humor to get through a lot of this stuff. But um, yeah, I think trying to make myself laugh on the page was also another important way that I didn't lose my mind in some, sure. some ways. Yeah. Can we talk about reviews? Yeah, yeah. Great. I'll give you my first favorite review. Yeah, I, I'm going to give you this. Yeah. So, Elaine on Amazon calls the book disappointing. I love that one. <laughs> um, I really want to get a book. I want Norton, who like prints the books, to make me a special book that has just bad reviews on it. There's, so, Tommy Orange here has one that, mm. that says, you know, reading this book, I literally laughed and cried. There's this guy on goodreads or amazon he left a review that went he goes i neither laughed nor cried he's like he goes he goes i did yawn a few times though and like i want that to be like the title of like the, the title blurb um but i love bad reviews they're great you feel free to give me like if you want to give me five stars and you have something nice to say go ahead but you can cut the nice stuff and just say something bad feel like this book sucks you know anything i just find it amusing here i'm compartmentalizing my pain well I wanted to read a couple reviews that we did, and oh, okay. we we asked. We have a pretty big audience at Wabanaki Public Health and Wellness. We have an organization of nearly two hundred people, seventy percent Indigenous, sixty-five percent women, and we have thirteen locations now across the state. And so we put a shout out to, I would say, um, well, a mix of people, but. So they wanted to give you some reviews. Oh, all right. Okay. So let's read some. I like gonna, this. This is fun. Yeah, this is fun. Yeah. Your publisher's going to love this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Take that picture, Brie. <laughs> so oh, these we're are gonna, the reviews? Yeah, but oh, okay. the, you can take those home. Okay, I'm going to read you. you a couple. Okay. Awesome. Let's see what we have here. Oh, here's a great one. Just. <laughs> Me? I don't. I know. No, oh, should I redo it? Like. <laughs> His publisher oh always wants pictures, right? So she does. Yeah, she's like, get pictures, get pictures. I went to one event and I took pic I took pictures of just random shit. I took a picture of a carpet. I took a picture of like a side table. There was a tray with empty glasses. I took a picture of that. And I was like, hey, Becky, here's the pictures from the trip. And there was like thirty just like bad pictures. Um, so yeah. So we're stepping it up, and we brought a photographer. Yeah, yeah. So just send the bad ones. And then. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's read some reviews. And this is Indigenous Readers Reviews. The first. 
to see our language, words, and culture in print, coupled with Morgan's great success, is healing in action. Passamaquoddy citizen. Morgan Tolte, it's amazing. I couldn't put it down. I can just picture all the places on the res you wrote about. A huge inspiration to say the least. Penobscot Youth Council member. I'll just read a couple more because I know you hate this. <laughs> oh, here's one. I like his cover. It's cool. Two thumbs up. <laughs> Eight-year-old. <laughs> Micmac. What else here? Seeing indigenous representation matters to me because it keeps my culture alive and furthers my learning. Passamaquoddy youth. Oh, I know which one I'm going to read to you now. And then I'll stop. Um, all right, this is a good one. A Penobscot elder shared, I have known Morgan since he was a baby. It's not embarrassing. Oh, okay. Right. No. <laughs> and his mother would bring him to visit at the health department. I'm fascinated by his ability to write so well. While reading his stories, I feel a wide range of emotions from laughter to sadness and anger. I am proud to know Morgan and to be able to say, I know this kid. <laughs> and you need to read his stories, everyone. She wants you to know. Um, Morgan, you amaze me. Passamaquoddy, oh, Penobscot Elder. So you have many, many more to read. Yeah, I've never, I've never cried in an event before. Oh, that's not that, what we're doing here. But that could, that could <laughs> break, that, yeah, that, uh, this is very kind. Thank you Aww. so, so much. Um, yeah, I'm very speechless right now. Yeah. I'm like very, very speechless. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. I don't like to frame things, but that I'm going to frame. Yeah, good. Now I'm going to go around and be like, was it you who said it? I'm gonna, when I, <laughs> next, time I, next time I go to the Iowa at the clinic, I'm like, did you say this quote about me? No, it's going to be character for quote. Character for quote? Okay, mm -hmm. all right, all right. Mm -hmm. We can have a deal. <laughs> all right. <laughs> In terms of the stories, I don't even know if this is, well, you're going to tell me if this isn't a good question to ask, but I want to know if you have a favorite story. I want to know, do you have a favorite, I have more questions than that, but let's start there. Yeah, I think, oh God, um, there's a lot of them I like in this, in this book. Um, I think the name means thunder is probably my, mm. my favorite, my most favorite story just because it took me so long to, it took me so long to write it. Mm -hmm. It took me like two years to get the story right. Um, and multiple, multiple drafts. It was the hardest one to write. Um, and it was the one I was most proud of, I think, mm -hmm. because I, I think that story, like, is, like, the most mature in a way mm -hmm. out of all of them, even though I had written other ones, you know, after and after that I'd written that story. But that one's definitely, I think, my favorite just because of the way it sort of is, like, an epilogue in a mm. sense to the book but also like by itself it, it stands entirely by itself it was a, it was published originally by itself in the Georgia Review um, which I love Work, when, when I worked with them they cut the last page and a half of the story so what's published there isn't how it ends here um, which is kind of cool I was like when I put the book together I was like oh this ending now works um, which is fascinating but yeah that story I think Earth Speak is also mm -hmm. was also a good a good story um there's the moment where d is like in the boiler room like listening mm -hmm. to the boiler sound and i remember for an hour and a half i listened to a youtube video of a boiler and i wanted to jump out of the window it was just so it drove me crazy and like that's how i was able to write it and Got it. um so that story was also like a very interactive like trying to recreate stuff um so those two are really 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 my favorites. Um, I'm surprised so many people like in a field of straight caterpillars. Yeah, like, people do. Yeah, because mm -hmm. I, that that was never actually originally in the book. Mm -hmm. um, that one and Half-Life were not in the collection. Tin House later was like, do you have other stories? And I sent them four, two David, two D, and they took the two D ones. Um, but everybody who had read in a field of straight caterpillars was like, this story's not good. 
and I kind of agreed with them on like a craft level, but people like people it. Like so. It. Yeah. I just want to do a time check. Yeah. It started out now. Great. So we started a little bit late tonight. Okay. If anyone has any okay. Ideas. Great. Um, let me just look at my questions. Of course. Oh, I have some um, about youth, but the first one I want to ask you is in terms of your own youth. What turned you on to reading? When did you think you wanted to write? When did you start that process? And just really, um, what was your favorite book as a child? Like those types of um, sparks of imagination as a young person. What was that? To be honest, I hated reading and writing oh, growing I'm up. I'm so glad to hear that. I hated it so I much. So it was just terrible. Um, through elementary school, middle school, I just like did not like reading and writing. Like I put up with it. I think in middle school, the only book I ever like devotely read and really liked was Holes. Um, I can't remember the author. You know? Yeah, um, Holes. I loved Holes. Um, and I had already seen a couple of the Harry Potter movies, mm -hmm. so I dove into the books and I could like visualize people, you know. Um, and so those ones. And then high school, I, you know, maybe things would have been different, but there were just a lot of things that in my home life that impeded attention to school. Um, and so who knows, maybe I would have had a different, you know, attitude towards reading and writing then. Um, but it really wasn't until I was like 18 that. I was like, oh, I'm gonna be a writer. And really, I mean, I feel like I've been a storyteller my whole life. Mm -hmm. Like growing up, like I always told stories, and, you know, and like stories that were true and also false at the same time. I remember in Indian Island having a parent teacher conference and the teacher was like to my mom, it was in second grade, she was like, uh, yeah, he, 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 he does, tell a lot of lies you know he's saying he, he's, he's saying he works for a moving company during the summer and and like it was technically not true but it was right. technically not false my dad owned a moving company and I would visit him in the summer and I used to go work on the job right. um, and so like those types of things I would say things and so I always and I'd always tell stories with friends you know we'd hang out you know in middle school and then in high school in my shed you know in the summer to get away from the heat or in the winter to away from the cold even though it's still cold in there um and i would just tell stories like mm -hmm. of what had happened what you know happened earlier that day that was yeah. funny you know i just always loved telling stories and seeing people's reactions to it yeah. and plus i grew up with a mother who was a fantastic storyteller um orally like she was just like something would happen i would be there and had witnessed it and then she would talk to my aunt one of my aunts on the phone and she would be telling the story and she'd get like 30% of it right. <laughs> the rest of it was either like, she just literally believe, like, like believed that's how it happened or she made it up for effect. I think it was a mix of both. And so I was pretty good at like, mm -hmm. at doing that. And you know, I, I was 18 and I, I remember I um, applied to college and I got rejected like everywhere. And cause my grades were bad, my SAT scores were like just terrible. Um, and the only place that accepted me was, um, I was devastated when UMaine Orno didn't accept mm -hmm. me. And I was like, oh my God. So I went to Eastern Maine Community College mm -hmm. and it was there that I just sort of was like, I'm gonna, I, I started reading and I started really appreciating literature. And I was like, the thing I love the most can be done in this way. And so I just sort of pursued it. And stubbornly, and I think I was stubborn in that I kept at it, you know, I just kept at it. And I mean, I wrote, I didn't get a story published in, for, for nine years. Like mm -hmm. I spent just nine years writing and sending stories out. And so it was like, it wasn't until I was 18 and you know, throughout you know, all these different, I don't know, I just couldn't picture myself doing anything else. I couldn't picture my, myself sitting behind, <laughs> sitting behind a desk. I sit behind a desk and anyway, <laughs> my tongue is um, But you know, like I couldn't do I get fired from any job that had me doing, you know, talking with people on the phone. Like that would not work. Um, so it was just a very like I had just limited options. It was like I guess I got to do this thing. And 
but then I encountered teaching, and yeah. then I really, really loved teaching. Um, and now, you know, UMaine didn't accept me, but now I'm a professor there, which is weird. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but, yeah, I, I was about 18, and but I have a very non-traditional, pro like, yeah. like a lot of people, though. Like, I think, like, people think it's, like, you have to, like, to be a writer, you have to start reading and writing when you're, like, three. Mm -hmm. And that's not true. Like, mm -hmm. so many writers don't get their start until late in life. I mean, Toni Morrison, who won the Nobel Prize in literature, I don't think she published her first book until she was over 40, I think. Wow. Or something like, could be making mm -hmm. that up. No, I'm kind of <laughs> scared, but I'm pretty sure. Um, so yeah, pretty late, pretty, not a late start, but a medium start. Very cool. Okay. I'm going to go back to the boiler room that you said you spent time in. I was curious about how you did get into that zone. What What's around you? What is your writing process like? I know it's different for everyone, but what is yours like? Usually depends on the project or like the draft that I'm I'm working on. If it's a if it's a first draft of something, I'll tend to if it's a short story, it usually takes me like a short story that's like the length of these ones. Mm -hmm. They usually take me about like five to seven days to write. Um, I've learned that I can't. I always hear stories of writers just sitting down and writing out a first draft from start to finish, and I'm like, I don't know how you do that. Mm -hmm. um, like me, I have to write somewhere between 500 and 1,200 words. Mm -hmm. Like anything under, I feel like a failure. Anything over, I'm just like, I've like pulled muscles in a way. Mm -hmm. And so I just chip away at it, and yep. I stop. I take Hemingway's advice. I stop when I know what the next thing is going to be. So that way when I start the next day, oh, yeah. I, I don't have to think. I'm like, okay, now I know where we're going. Right. Um, so with first drafts, it's pretty much like that. Mm -hmm. And I get up and I walk a lot and mm -hmm. I pace. Because I, I feel like the best ideas happen when you can't write them down or you're like far away from a computer. Mm -hmm. So I trick my mind into thinking I'm like away. So I'll be like 10 feet away from my computer and my brain's like, oh, it'd be cool if you did this, but ha ha ha, you can't write it down. And I'm like, well, joke's <laughs> on you, my computer's right there. Um, so I do that and um, eventually, you know, when it's done, I work on the computer, mm -hmm. but then I print it out. I mm -hmm. work on a hard copy. Um, and again, it's weird. I'll, make sure my computer will be like in my kitchen, but then I'll work on the hard copy on the couch and I'll get up and go back and forth. Mm -hmm. And just this weird, I don't know, I'm a weirdo. Um, and so I do that, but yeah, it's really, I think like the, the constant absolute process is like sitting down and writing, mm -hmm. which is the hardest thing mm -hmm. to do. It really, it really mm -hmm. is. Um, Louise Erdrich found herself mm -hmm. getting up a lot when she was writing yeah. and the story goes that she took a scarf and she tied herself to her chair um, or a rope or something and like she like went to get up but was pulled back down and so she just kept writing. Um, I don't know if she still does that. It'd be interesting <laughs> to ask her. Um, but yeah, that's the hardest part is like sitting and doing the work. Yeah. I think we're going to ask some questions from the audience. You ready for that? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Phyllis. Can we? Can I hand this to you though, just so everyone can hear? Just hand this way. Thanks, Nathan. So you were telling us about the story that was your favorite. Can you tell the audience about that story? I'm, I don't think everybody's read the book, but just to give us some insight into the story. You got it. Yeah. So the name means thunder. Is um, told from David's point of view and throughout the book we see David as it ranges from you know like seven up to 18 mm -hmm. like we see him in those in that yeah. age range and then we see him older you know throughout his 20s to early 30s mm -hmm. and the name means thunder is a is a large departure from that time um, it's David who's now I think in like his 60s late 50s or, so, or something like that looking back on this one story um, about a uh, about a child that mm -hmm. his sister had had, um, and who was suffering from postpartum depression mm -hmm. um, and depression from other related events mm -hmm. due to the child, um, and it's this story about he needs to go see the doctor to get his eyes, mm -hmm. his cataracts checked, mm -hmm. and um, he doesn't. The way he opened, the way he sort of dives into the story is by saying he needs to get the story right because he doesn't know how much the doctor needs to know. Mm -hmm. 
And it's all about this culminating moment in which David, I won't spoil it, but ultimately is like staring at the sun and loses his, his vision. Um, it's a great story. You should read it. <laughs> um, but yeah, I feel like I don't, I'm so bad at describing the stories. I think that does it a little bit of justice, but it's a very culminating moment, I think, for the book because it feels very much like an epilogue. Like it really looks back on, it gives, it, it gives us insight into the characters that we haven't seen mm-hmm. while sort of closing the book on them. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, please. So we actually have a question from the internet. Oh, okay. And Margot says that she's really enjoying this conversation. She's laughing out loud while walking her dog around Borno. So someone's enjoying it. Um, She says, can you talk more about the otherworldly aspect of the addictions and other challenges that characters experience? I can try to talk to it. Can you say it again real quick? Um, It's hard because it's not my question. The otherworldly aspects of the addictions and other challenges the characters experience. Yeah, I think um, I don't know how to answer that. That's hard. I think it's like you know, those challenges and those addictions that, that they dealt with and by otherworldly, I, I'm going to take it to mean relating to sort of like transcendental moments maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm always fascinated by like this notion of epiphany right like you come up with like an epiphany and it with these characters who are struggling with substance abuse it's like I think anybody you anybody you've dealt and, and anybody you have in your life who is who, who you have a relationship with who has been an addict or still is an addict or always will be an addict even if they stopped you know they're they're full of epiphanies right and so are you. Like, it's like, we need to get better, we need to get better, we need to get better. And um, it's like, how do you escape that to go beyond, you know, the we need to get better to a point that it's like, we really need to get better. Mm-hmm. And it's something that I tried my hardest to do in this book was to get to that other sort of level of, like, care that I think we need to have for people just because in my own experience – you know, having family members struggle from drug and alcohol Mm -hmm. um, addiction, you know, and seeing how hard it was for them um, and myself too, you know, Mm -hmm. to to deal with it, you know, it's Mm -hmm. like, I've lived those things. And so, I mean, not as an addict, but I've lived those things as a person who's, um, you know, been there with, with people who are suffering from addiction. And it's like, so I kind of know that the, that there's those quiet moments of like, Mm -hmm transcendence that keep getting experienced but it's like how do you really do it like you think about and I'm not criticizing the way we approach um, addiction or anything but I mean because I think there are a lot of ways that mm-hmm. it can be Im- improved but you think of like graduations that get ha- that get had for people graduating from rehab and stuff those are like great right mm-hmm. like those are moments that are supposed to be transcendental mm-hmm. but in a lot of the ways it's like they don't always work, you know, mm-hmm. and it's like I've been at those before and people who are graduating are still using mm-hmm. and it, it's very strange and it's like, again, I'm not criticizing the, these types of programs because they're needed, but it's like, what more, like what else can we think of, think of, you know, what can we get at to, I don't know, like really, to really heal, I guess. Mm-hmm. Like what, what is the formula for it? Yeah. Um, and I don't know. I have no idea. Um, if I did, I'd tell you. Um, but yeah, I don't. I don't know. It's it's, yeah. it's a tricky, it's a tricky subject. Mm-hmm. Well, we should have coffee sometime because yeah. the organization, Wabanaki Public Health and Wellness, it, that's what it's all focused on: is how do we truly heal from the traumas yeah. that are present, and you get a glimpse of those traumas through this book. And what we all know is that those traumas are um, multiple. Um, you know, when addiction is more prevalent than not, when cigarettes are more prevalent than not, that's a lot of 
results from historical traumas and recent traumas that we need to heal from. So creating centers of healing is, yep. is one of those answers, but lots of movement on that front. And that's why I was so excited about this book because not only is it highlighting those issues, we're starting to have those conversations about what it truly means to heal. What does that look like? What do those services look like? It doesn't look like some of the programs you described were so prevalent in your book. Yeah. Right? More questions? Please. I don't think that's going to work. Yeah, please come up. I'll meet you halfway. It's okay. I like walking. So, um, I don't know how to phrase this. Let's see. <laughs> So the oral tradition is obviously not what it once was. It used to be how you told a story. If all things considered, it was equal writing the stories down and telling them. As you said, as a kid, you liked to tell stories. Would you prefer that, or would you prefer having this hard copy that people can just take with them somewhere? Great right, Tim Morgan. Thank you. That's a great question. Um, I don't know. <laughs> well, what's interesting is I did an event in Portland. I literally can't remember if it was last night or the night before. No, it was the night before. A couple nights ago. A couple nights ago. And um, uh, Connor Quinn, I'm not sure if mm -hmm. people are familiar with Connor Quinn, but he's a, he's a linguist who came in the 90s, I believe. In the 90s, yeah. In the 90s, and he worked with Penobscot elders and I think Pass also Passamaquoddy. Um, and he developed an alphabet system. He, yeah. he did all of this, this amazing stuff. And um, he was, we were talking after the thing. He's like, have you thought about having your book translated into Penobscot? And I was like, not until now. Um, <laughs> and he was like, he was like, because I've read, he's like, I read, he's like, I read your, he's like, I've read, you know, the first story a couple of times. Mm -hmm. And he's like, hearing you read it out loud, he was like, he was translating it in his head and he was like it's very translatable because of the way because of the diction of the storytelling mm -hmm. so i feel like part of like my like my growing up you know mm -hmm. telling stories like sort of imparted itself in the way that i write sense. in a way yeah. um so i'm not trying to shy away from the question but i think like in in a way like this book was in my attempt to like capture that voice you know that oral storytelling voice here um, but I love when people just take stories and like mm -hmm. make them their own. You know what I mean? Like they keep the facts the same and then they mm -hmm. spin them and stuff. But, um, yeah, I think, oh God, that's hard. Mm. That's hard. I'll just say I have both. I'm going to cheat and just say I want both the oral story that gets sent out, but then also, yeah. also the book version. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that, that's a, that's a great question. Of course we want to see our language. I mean, this translated would be fantastic. Yeah, it would be very, very cool. And then I think about how powerful it is to walk into virtually any bookstore now across the nation, and our youth can see your book. And that is so powerful for indigenous young people to see an indigenous author in those places. So I, I agree with your both. We need both. What other questions do we have? Please. Thank you, Raven. We have another one. Uh, this one is from Velvet, who asks, can you talk more about your story, Safe Harbor? Uh, I can talk more about that story. Um, so yeah, Safe Harbor, I never really originally intended for that story to appear in this book until much later, m much l further, farther down the road. Um, Safe Harbor was really, um, so if you read Safe Harbor, um, it's about a D visiting his mother in a crisis yeah. stabilization unit. And I've always been very open with, with this story, but, um, but the, um, when my mom was alive, she suffered from depression mm -hmm. um, and alcoholism, and and she often would go to um, a, a crisis stabilization unit 
the, the one that safe harbors mm -hmm. in Brewer, mm -hmm. actually, there's a, there's one in yeah. Brewer. Um, and that was the one she would usually go to. And, um, you know, it's the place for people to, to recoup sort mm -hmm. of, to get better and, um, to feel better. And so I was always out there. I was always, you know, when she would go there, I would go out and it was usually to bring her cigarettes. She'd be like, can you bring me a pack <laughs> of cigarettes? I'm like, sure. And while I was there, we'd eat lunch, watch TV, have coffee. And I don't know if I, I think I may have, I don't know if I smoked then I quit, but we used, I think we used to smoke too, but, um, would color, we'd hang out, you know, and, and it was always just nice to, to be with her there because it was outside of this different sort of like environment. Mm -hmm. And, um, I was there visiting her one day when she'd wanted me to bring her cigarettes, which I did. She wanted me to get cigarettes for her friend, mm -hmm. Meryl, but that wasn't really her name. Um, <laughs> there was a guy there who was, was there was a guy there who was like, checking for rats, the exterminator guy. Um, and there was a quote written, um, a ship in harbor is safe, but that is not what ships are built for. Um, you know, everything up, and when I was there, that's when I saw my mother have a seizure. Mm, and if you've ever seen anybody have a sick. seizure, especially a grand mal seizure, it's one of the most frightening, frightening yeah. things in the world. It was mm -hmm. like, at that moment, that was like the true, that was the moment I recognized the difference between body and spirit. Like, mm -hmm. like actually understood the difference between the right. two. Like I thought I knew what that meant, but mm -hmm. like witnessing somebody have a seizure, I was like, okay, now I know. Mm -hmm. And it was the most terrifying thing. And I went home that day and I wrote everything out as much in as much detail as I could remember yes. up to the point of her having the mm -hmm. seizure. And I just let the story sit for a while. I didn't know what to do with it. I just mm -hmm. felt it was important to write it down. Mm -hmm. And like I said earlier, I started writing nonfiction. Mm -hmm. And I got to parts where I was like, what if this happened? And so I went back to that story. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I wonder if I can push this further. And so I started to play with this fraught relationship between Dee and, and mom. And in many ways, it was very representative of, of our own relationship. Mm -hmm. And I pushed the story. Um, and you know, revise some stuff early on that didn't actually happen, um, you know, like with the girlfriend and the and the cat and, and stuff <laughs> like that. Um, and it ultimately wound up, you know, the last third of the story or the last fourth of the story was all sort of fiction, and then the rest of it I went and had to redo a couple little things. But um, it, it's strong auto fiction yeah. is, is what it is. Um, and yeah, that that was a that story took me forever to get right. The last line mm -hmm. just took me it took me like a year to figure it out. Um, and then when I figured it out, I was like, I'm an idiot. And then I got, <laughs> like this works. So. Any other questions? Yeah, please. go back to the title. I haven't read your book and I want to. <laughs> but I, I often wonder how, how um, I don't know if you talk about people being unhoused and just low income situations, but your title kind of jars me a little bit. <laughs> Having grown up in a Detroit, Michigan, which is the largest hellscape I've ever seen in my whole life. And I spent a lot of time in those dark cold nights in the city. <laughs> so I just wonder if you could speak to that. Yeah, I don't, mm, I don't think there's homelessness mm -mm. in the book. There's like a feeling of homelessness. Okay, some couch surfing. Some couch surfing. Not paying rent. Not paying rent, couch surfing. <laughs> um, but none of the, but none of the, um, like real dark stuff yeah. that that is you know part of being homeless um i've never been homeless but you know my mother's been homeless my sister's been homeless and so like i know familiar with that in some in some in some way um but i don't approach i don't talk about it mm -hmm. in, in in a way like that i want to at some point i think mm -hmm. um but there is you know the characters in the in the in this book don't have a lot of money they don't you know they I think food and food pantry is the thing mm -hmm. they go to, you know, occasionally. Um, you know, they are, you know, without 
this is, I'll describe it this way. I'm not saying the book is nonfiction because <laughs> it's not, but my mom was always like, if we didn't live on the res, we'd be homeless mm -hmm. because we had the support of the community. We had a little food pantry. We had, you know, a very low rent, mm -hmm. you know, we had mm -hmm. health care, we had mm -hmm. child care, mm -hmm. you know, and so the res reservation in our community sort of just like saved us. And like, I think that's the case for these characters too, is it's like, I think if we took them out Oh, yeah. of this environment I don't know what it would yeah. what it would look like and that's one of the terrible things about indigenous homelessness mm -hmm. in the US is because especially in cities because mm -hmm. so 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 few cities have like they have urban centers and stuff mm -hmm. but they're not as accessible that's but right. to answer your question um, the title is jarring and I think there is also a lot of jarring elements in the book too mm -hmm. but hopefully there's enough laughter to mitigate the bad feelings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. James, do you have a question? No? Okay. How did you choose what language to use in the book? It's, I mean, the language that you chose to use is often funny. Um, but, you know, how did you choose, were those the words you heard the most? I found it interesting because those are the words I knew, um, but just wanting to hear how you chose those words. The Penobscot words? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think they were just mainly words I'd heard growing up mm -hmm. and like, because if you ask me what I remembered from middle school, taking middle school Penobscot language with yeah. Carol Dana, it would be a bin, <laughs> which is sit down, sit down, and just stouts, which is shut up. Um, <laughs> you know, those, those, those are the two most commonly used uh, words um, in, in that course. Um, there were others, but we didn't listen. Um, and so it was just, you know, stuff I'd heard growing up mm -hmm. and stuff I remembered. And it was really weird. And I was, I was talking to Connor Quinn about this, yeah. too. I was like, when I was writing the book, I found myself like, I found myself in moments where I was going to say something mm -hmm. and say it in Penobscot and I was like, is that even Penobscot? Mm -hmm. And it was weird how like writing the book opened up like my subconscious and let yes. some stuff out. And like one example is in, in a jar, Paige says to, to David, uh, BD gay, which means come on in. Mm -hmm. And apparently, I don't know where I heard it, I'd heard mm -hmm. it somewhere. I asked Carol, Dana, I Facebooked her. I was like, how do you say come on in? And she said it. Um, and I was like, I don't know. I don't know where I, I don't know where I heard it. I'd heard it somewhere. It was in my brain. Maybe she said it between a bin and just Dowks. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, it was really, I just chose to, you know, do it as naturally as I could, you know, and, and as authentically as I could, you know, like how and when they would say it or how we would say it. You know, my grandmother was always, you know, something happened, you know, she'd say chigawk or something, yeah. you know, something. And like, right. you know, it was like looking for those moments where it would, where where it would happen. It. Yeah. That's very good. No questions here? I have a question. Please. Hi. Oh, you're okay. It's pretty loud. Thank you. Um, first off, congratulations on the New England Book Award. That's Thank you. Really yes. cool. um, secondly, I'm not exactly, I'm trying to phrase this the best way. Um, a friend of mine on Facebook, uh, Barry Dana, he recently uh, posted something about a white writer wanting all of these details of kind of, because he's, he's an indigenous person, and um, wanting all of these details um, you know, for their stories and so forth. And he was of the opinion, and, and I agree, that with so many great indigenous storytellers, it feels kind of like, why do we need white people co-opting those stories? And I was just wondering if you could maybe talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Thank you. It's a great question, thank you. Um, yeah, I think you'll find, you know, many Native writers who are like, or Indigenous people in general who are like, mm -hmm. non-Native people should not tell stories from the perspectives of Native people. And me as a writer, my opinion is that you can write anything you want, mm -hmm. but should you? 
Like, that's the thing. And so, like, I have read works by non-natives because I, I, I read a lot of manuscripts by developing writers um, and, you know, writers who are young, writers who are old, older. And, you know, I've read some really weird shit, like really <laughs> weird stuff. Um, and especially from Native American point of views, like indigenous characters that they'll create, like there was this like, we, I won't even get into it, uh, but I think that if we're, if the point of view of the book is from an indigenous person, let an indigenous person tell that story. I think though that if we're, if, if a, if a non-native writer is trying to get information about a character, right? And if it's a secondary character or a third or like a, you know, a character that's really in the peripheral, like, I think that's fair, you know, um, because if they're writing a book about, you know, some, like a, a non-native person, right? A historical piece. And this non-native person had a relate like some type of relations with an indigenous person, right? Be it Louis Sock Alexis or something, you know, maybe somebody famous or some, somebody who's not famous. It's like, why, if they're going to write that book, why mm-hmm. should we withhold some, you know, what we know about this person mm-hmm. in a way? Um, and it's not like they're setting out to tell that person's story, right? As long as that's the case. Like, that's my opinion, is it's like, leave the indigenous point of view to indigenous people, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but if it's, you know, something in the very peripheral, it's like, I don't know what, I don't know how mm-hmm. it can harm. Maybe it can, you know. Maybe I'll bite my words <laughs> in, a, in a couple of years. I'll read a book where somebody does this and they manipulate and mm-hmm. do something bad. But it's true. There, there have been ri- so many writers who have monopolized like an indigenous story to make money. Um, and not just indigenous stories, but other stories by marginalized voices. Um, there's this one book with this really convoluted title that got a lot of praise. Um, and it was supposedly this Navajo guy who was a memoir it was, it was sold as a memoir um, mm-hmm. about this Navajo guy who uh, had, was like an alcoholic and he had a kid who suffered from fetal, fetal alcohol syndrome and um, it was like a National Book Critics Circle Award like yeah. finalist or whatever. Found out the guy was a white guy <laughs> and he was just a white, this white dude who wrote gay porn. What? And he was apparently like, I need money. And so he decided why not write Mm -hmm. from the perspective of a native person and make money and i bet he did make a lot of money Mm -hmm. off that book Mm -hmm. um but yeah it's i agree with him Mm -hmm. that's a long way of saying i agree with him (laughs) (laughs) i guess i'll hold it up any other questions i have some rapid fire questions yeah sure one or two answers yeah two words kind of thing yeah what is your favorite snack when you write? <laughs> I can't eat when I write. Really? Yeah, I just oh, write. Wow. Okay. I actually used to only I would write I wouldn't eat anything and I'd write until like eleven AM until I was like starving. Wow. It was very weird, yeah. All right. What is your Halloween costume this year? <laughs> Pirate. Very cool. <laughs> What are you reading right now? My God, I don't know. <laughs> a lot of manuscripts that are due next week. Got it. <laughs> 18 of them to be exact. Oh. What do you do for fun? Oh, I yell at my video games. Video um, games. <laughs> and walk, play basketball. We used to love to travel before the pandemic, but now it's just like a weird thing, even though I still do travel. Um, and watch YouTube videos and get to a point where I'm like, how did this end up in my recommended feeds? Um, and lately, watching the new Game of Thrones mm. series, although I got very mad when they switched the person, Millie, to the other person, which I, I guess they were doing all along, but I was in the dark about. Like, they were supposed to tell me you know, um, so I had to stop watching that episode for the day, but then I got over it and went back to it. That was not one or two words, but <laughs> none of them. Have none been. of them, yeah. No. I have another one. What are you most looking forward to in 2023? My baby. 
my wife and I are having a baby due in March 15th is the due date. Well, our team was hoping you would save your baby oh. because we brought you oh, some no, you indigenous didn't. baby books from our Literacy and Love program. So we have a little gift for you, and um, Leans, can you give that to Morgan? Half of it's for your baby, and half of it's for you. Well, thank you all so, so very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Any final questions before we close? Oh, yay, great. So I'm a high school English teacher, and I read your book thinking about sharing it with my students. What would you want kids to take away or you mm -hmm. to take away from this book? Great question. I think I'll give the answer I give to you. Yeah, thank you very much for that question. Um, where do you teach? Milo. Milo, OK. Um, I think the biggest thing that I want people in general to take away from the book is that we can care for each other more, that we can you know, be there more for people. Um, you know, for youth, I think, I think you know, I want youth to understand you know, that there is a way out right you know that there isn't this you know that we're not trapped even when we think we are um you know i think growing up i had a i think a lot of people a lot of people who live on the reservation were always like oh man i hate living here you know and like my mom did it and moved off and she regretted leaving and like all this stuff and i'm always you know growing up i think i had that feeling too of being like apprehensive like i don't know like feeling like, like for those who are suffering in a way, like to know that it's not all bad, like that there is this goodness that comes. And, you know, I'm reminded of this Jane Austen quote that it's like, one does not love the, one does not love a place the less for having suffered in it, unless it's been all suffering, nothing but suffering. Um, and like, that's the thing I would hope you take away from it is like, things get better. You know, mm -hmm. things don't always have to be you know, as bad as they are, because there are so many youth out there who, who are in very rough places with their families, you know, with their own lives. Um, and yeah, so hopefully the book can do that for them. Thank you. Thank Any you. questions? Any more questions? Are we done? Any other questions? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Thank you so much. You're